Okay, now I'll try to walk you through uh, lecture three. Uh, lecture one, you had the practical information, you had a little about Mathematica, and we realized that we didn't really have time enough, so now we're going to the podcast option. Uh, as far as I know, with what you handed in now, there's a huge improvement in the assignments you made uh, for lecture two which was concerning loss of significance and symbolic optimization and matrix inversion. Uh, you have probably also received a will, a link on how to handle lists, which we will also use in the lecture we're going through now, which is concerning linear and polynomial interpolation and smoothing. And there you will get assignment nine to 12. This is about uh, how we make experiment, experimental data ready for computations. And we will have a look how you cooperate with Excel, getting the data ready, which that is really nice too, and then how you import it. The data is uh, obtained, it's uh, some discrete data points, and this is how you get rid of MI, BK, I don't know what it is, you are the chemist. But it's in a biofilter, and when you mix that with biomass and air, you can end up getting carbon dioxide and water. And what you, uh, if you measure on it, if you have the time here in hours, and you have the concentration, you can see it degrades to zero after approximately 58 hours. It's this little beast you, which has been degraded. The chemistry, you have to ask your other teachers for details. But what is really the cause here is when we want to play, we need continuous functions. And if you have these uh, discrete points, you saw, you are, do not have a continuous function, you only have points on it. And if we assume that there is something in between, then we can end up with a function saying that the concentration are equal to a function which depends on time. But why do we need that? We need that, for example, if we want to know the rate or the change in concentration over a time span. Uh, for example, also, it could be nice to have it so we can easily ask what would the concentration be at uh, 41 hours. You could make a linear interpolation like it has been done here uh, because we have a measurement from after 40 hours and 43 hours and then you can just make a linear interpolation. Uh, assignment 9, uh, that's where we are playing with how to enter the points. I will show some of it but you will have to do it yourself also. So if you enter this data in uh, Excel. Remember that if you have, uh, you, you know, the Danish way of putting this, uh, a decimal, we have a break, there's a phone disturbing me, we have a decimal uh, separator, then uh, in English uh, it's uh, a dot and in Danish it's a comma. Beware of this, so it suddenly it behaves strangely that a small number becomes really large, then it's probably uh, you have to look into this with the regional options. But let's have a look at Excel. I have entered the data here, so we have the number, we have the time, and we have the concentration. And this file, if you save that and give it a name like this, assignment 9, the input data, or whatever name you want, just remember it, then you can import it. The nice thing here with uh, Excel is that we can have a quick view on the data. If I can remember how to do that in Excel, I use Mathematica normally. Yeah, scatter points. So in insert, I need scatter point and here we can try to do it so we have uh, a smooth line you can also get a straight line for connectors and this is a really nice and quick way to look at it 
You can also go in and say, I want, uh, if I, you right click, then you can say, add a trend line. You can select data, you can do all data, but add a trend line, then you have different things here. Uh, you have a linear, it's just straight points, logarithmic, polynomial, which you can set, a moving average, that's how to get rid of noise, we will come into that later. But let's take a polynomial, let's take a fourth order, trying to squeeze it a little. And we would like to see the equation, and the R squared. Now we see if we take a fourth order, it tries to fit a fourth order polynomial through it and it's not really uh, performing nicely. But it's a try. So now we've seen how <coughs> you can play with it in Excel. Excel is nice for this quick and dirty, put data in uh, and you can have some first touch on it here. But Mathematica really has some other power options. So let's Go further. This is how you can integrate it directly into Mathematica. You should probably try it. You take select, uh, insert data matrix, and then a new one you can define how big it is, and then you can enter the data directly, like you, like shown here. The next step is you can also import the Excel file you saw uh, this one, you can import it. This is really, I think, the best way of doing it. Uh, so first you enter it, you put a column header on. Column headers is what is put up here, because then you can use it directly in Mathematica. You can also discharge that, uh, but that's up to you. Then you import, you have to set, if you place the file directly in the notebook or in a subdirectory in the notebook directory, then you have to define here that you set the directory, that's the directory your notebook is looking at. So you, if you say import, it will start in this directory where the notebook is. So here you say import, you put it into a variable, and here you have to put the file name. Then you can use a table form to look at the data. And here I said I, I want to look at all the data, but only on excluding the first uh, row. Uh, but let's have a look at that. Play with that in Mathematica. This is all, almost a recipe how to do it. Uh, here you can see the data. Um, and if you want to look at, for example, one column, uh, this is number two. You can recognize the last numbers here, 55, 58, it's here. Let's see, I'll just split it so it's easier to read it. You can see here it's a traditional form. I get rid of some of the brackets. Then you can look at it. <coughs> uh, but if you want to import it, here I use the set directory. Then I say the MIBK data is equal to an import. And here I use this dot means that's the current directory, but then I put another directory called assignment input data. If you have placed your Excel sheet in the same directory, you just have to discharge uh, this part. Delete that. Uh, then you say assignment nine, input data or whatever your file name is, and then you can see the data here, including the column header. So now I just get rid of the column headers here. Delete that one. I'll look like this. And I put in the variables, like the number, the time, I mean, IPK data. You can also discharge this if you can handle doing it directly. Now I want to first look on the data. And here you can use a command, remember to use help to get further information, call this plot. So 
it's a kind of uh, splitting the data and putting it together just to give you an overview so you can see what happens. So here I say I want a list considering of uh, build of time and MIBK and then I transpose it. <laughs> then I want the uh, uh, axis label to time and MIBK gram per cubic meter. And I want big markers. You have to play with this to get used to it. And then you get this nice little figure illustrating the data. You can also uh, link these markers, but you have to look into help how to do that. If something looks for a joint, then you'll probably figure it out. Now we want to fit a uh, straight line through the data just to see a trend line, if you can call that. That's also what you could do in, in uh, Excel. This was a polynomial, but you could also um, see if I can figure out to use Excel. It's very seldom I use it. But here you can see a straight trend line through it. And you have the equation here, an R squared. So let's have a look. You can recognize the trend line from Excel. What happens is that when, when you make this linear model fit, in fact, we'll come back to that later. We're jumping a little ahead. I said I just want the equation considering of x using x. So that's because you can use several variables if it's 2D. See more on help. And here you have the equation. But this fit, you can extract a lot of data. And I was, uh, you can look and help what you can get out of data, but it's really a lot. Uh, considering how well the plot was. But here we merge it all together. Show is a way to, to merge two different plots. So first we take the list plot you have already seen. It goes until here. Then the second plot we want to merge in using show is plot. We have the fit. Consider that as a function where you have x. And x will be from 0 to 60. And then you get this line. So that's a kind of trend line. You can all, we can also have a look at the residual. That's just to give you an example, jumping a little here. Then I ask the fit, which has a contain all the data, kind of information container from the fit. I want the fit residuals. And then you can see how it looks. These straight lines I get by setting the option, filling option. Filling, put it down to axis, and I get these straight lines. So your assignment 9.4 is try to do this with a second order polynomial and compare it with a sixth order polynomial and compare it with a straight line. Let's have a look at the interpolation function. Uh, if you look at help, this one gives you an approximate function for the argument x. Uh, standard output, uh, you can see it in help, but it will just say that there's a lot more data uh, in it. For example, here I take the IFIT, I transpose the data, and it makes an interpolation. And this just indicates there's a lot more to come after. If I want to see what happens when I use the interpolation function, then, again, the list plot, I am use instead of fit, the i fit for i for interpolation. And then we can see how the data has been, uh, it's not, it's kind of bent lines between this, more of that soon. But you can also ask the interpolation function uh, for specific uh, values for different points. That's, in fact, what happens here ask for values from 1 to 59. 
uh, and now we get close to what was really nice here. It does the job for you. You can also uh, differentiate it. So, uh, in this assignment 10, you look at the derivative of the interpolation functions, how to use that. What is really nice is that you get, uh, you work with a mathematical function, which is continuous, no sharp corners. So it means that this one is continuous. It uh, have a defined ratio of curvature, so this one is nice. And it works in the whole range. Remember, it's interpolation, that's extrapolation. So it's between the data points. <laughs> Where you can feel safe. If you go the other side, strange thing happens. At least there's a risk. Uh, well, look is that we can have a kind of piecewise uh, linear interpolation. Uh, but the problem is, if it's just straight line, it's hard to fulfill these options here. So the assignment here, you have to try to do that. I also think I put a little tip. That if you use interpolation function like this, here you define that here's the interpolation order one, that's the same as putting a straight line. And then you can ask for the derivative a tree, see that, how it looks. You can also uh, second order derivative. And then you can use the plot function. So if you combine this with the range you played in the last assignment, uh, then you can see what happens. If you just have a brief overview interpolation function in Excel, uh, it's not uh, so good. There is some data about Mathematica, no problem. These wise curve fitting, you saw that. Uh, I don't think I showed you, but it can also handle that. But Mathematica is really the focus here. If you take with regression, yeah, Excel, you're happy with uh, uh, least square regression, but when you have played a little bit of Mathematica, you will really realize that Mathematica is a tool to use. Excel is good for quick, dirty view, but when you want to do real work, then uh, use Mathematica. Now we want to put some constraints on when we make this uh, interpolation. We want to have a flexible strip or kind of rubber you paint around each of the points. Uh, and how does that work? Engineers really like this, and uh, you can read this text to get more details. Press pause and you can read it, but it's also, uh, I think there's a link here where you can get it. But it's really a popular tool when you want to get kind of what should we say, extract the information between the points, get a good guess on what is happening there. If you want to look at the theory, uh, I think the easiest way is to have a look at YouTube, instead of me talking, then you get a little variation. I found one. You can look at the link if you want to use it later. So let's have a little lecture. Hello Internet. This video is going to show you how to approximate functions using cubic splines. First, let's talk about some of the ways we can approximate functions. One of them is to just draw straight lines between each point that we have. Another is to draw quadratic lines between each point that we have. Even better is to draw cubic lines. There's another method we can use which gives us an even better looking curve called splines. So what is a cubic spline? It's a function approximation that is continuous at the points that merge, but it also has a continuous first derivative and a continuous second derivative. Let's look at some examples. The first one on the left is an example of two functions that are not continuous. The middle example is two functions that are continuous but they don't have continuous first derivatives. This last example is continuous, 
as well as having a continuous derivative at the point where they join. A natural cubic spline is still a spline, but it also has a second derivative equal to zero at the endpoints. And unlike the Grange polynomials, each point in the line doesn't affect the entire line. So how do you calculate a cubic spline? Well, given a few points, we can write a function for the left two points and a function for the right two points and set them equal to each other where they join. We also need to make sure that their derivatives are equal to each other and that their second derivatives are equal to each other. And if we're making a natural cubic spline, we also need the, derivatives, the second derivatives at the endpoints to be zero. So this is a really large system of equations. Normally, you won't be asked to calculate a cubic spline. Here is an example test problem. Let's say you're given two functions, and you need to find the values of a, b, and c that make this a cubic spline. So let's look at our two functions, and we'll evaluate the first function at the point x equal to 1. Take its derivative, find that value at x equal to 1, and its second derivative, and find that value at x equal to 1. The other equation should have those exact same numbers of negative 2, 3, and 6. So we'll plug in 1, plug in the 1 at the first derivative, and plug in 1 at the second derivative. This gives us three equations and three unknowns, which we can solve so that a is 0, b is 0, and c is equal to negative 3. Let's look at another example. Find the value of a to make this a cubic spline. The first equation is simply s is equal to 0, which is still an equation. We'll also need to find its first derivative and second derivative when x is equal to 1, which is going to be equal to 0. Now let's look at our second equation. We set that equal to 0. Well, that doesn't tell us anything. The first derivative equal to 0 also doesn't tell us much. And the second equal to 0 also doesn't say much. When we say that a can be any value, this is saying that any value of a will make these two equations a cubic spline. But we also want to find the value of a that makes a natural cubic spline. So we'll look at the endpoints. In the first equation, oh, it's going to be 0. But the second equation, the second derivative also has to be 0. And in this case, the only value of a that makes this a natural cubic spline is 0. Thanks for watching. These uh, recordings. I think this is basically, he went through this theory. And in Mathematica, there's a lot more than cubic splines. Uh, you can really play with it. Uh, but if you need it, you can read more about it. Here's a little uh, extract. Uh, Mathematica has a cubic spline, which we will focus on here. But you also have uh, another option where you use hermite. Um, But, but the idea is, as you've seen, the interpolation uh, it returns as a function, interpolation function, you can just use it as it was a function. You can set the order of interpolation, so if it's on it's straight lines, and you can just increase that. You can select the method, spline, or the Hermite, and if you want more data on what it is, you can look at it here, at these two links. Uh, yes, time is running for me. The assignment 11 is uh, you, you have to play with the function, so try to use the spline and Hermite function on the MIBK data. You have to plot it in the first, second and third order. And please use the range from 1 to uh, 70 hours. And then uh, compare the results uh, here. Try to reflect on what is the difference. How does it look? And then give me the value here. There's a little for the nerds here. If you want to do it all in one step, uh, you can really have fun here. Uh, you can set, if you read a little here, I use 
table, put everything in the table, I make an interpolation on the data, I select a method which is M, if we go into M, M is either hermite or spline, and then we take the order D from 1 to 3. So now we get a, an array or list of function outputs. So if I, then we take the table form, put it in a table, put it in show, run to list plot. We take the and insert the ifit from, you see it was built based on these two. So there's either one or two, that's because we use hermite and spline. And we have the other dimension, j, where it says one to three. We set the table headings. And then you get a nice little thing here where you can reflect on what is the difference in your assignment. This is teacher's playground where we really have fun, but let's continue. So if you want to smooth the data, because sometimes it's noisy and it's not really, you, you need to get rid of uh, random noise, uh, get it more smooth. Uh, then you're not, uh, it's not the same way. Uh, and you have to use, you can use a kind of moving arrows. You don't get a function coming to how you could handle that. But let's see. Uh, yeah, and remember that it needs to be equal space, the data here you use. Of course, we can handle it if it's not, but let's start the basics. First, we clear the data here just to be sure we are not messed up with something from other places. Then we Try to use this function, which will give you some random numbers from 0 to 10, spaced with uh, 1 tenth. And we just have a look here. And you can see it's, it looks noisy, and we are quite sure this. The straight thing is probably to put a kind of bended curve to here. What we could do, trying to use a moving average. So there is a function called moving average of three. So it kind of take, if you're standing here, the next two points and wait with the other one and take the average. So let's have a look at it. The problem with doing this is that if you stand here and you take a moving average of the next three points, you kind of lift it all or you kind of shift the extrema minimum or maximum to get to the left. And the reason for this, the nice thing with moving average is that you can, if you put in uh, variables like this, you can see what happens. I say that I want from one, two, three, the weight. So here you can see that it weighs it this with 50%, this with, uh, what would that be? One third and then one sixth. So that's the kind of errors it's used when you, if you're standing in A, it's looking forward, what is coming in the future. You could do the same with moving media. The difference is not that big, you can try to extract the two and then have a look at it. Media is kind of a little more robust to if you really have an extreme extreme value, then uh, that one will uh, damp it. Uh, another way to do it is to smooth the data using a Gaussian kernel or whatever kernel, but here we'll use a Gaussian kernel to smooth the noisy data. It has uh, another nice feature using that is if you take the derivative, it's just the derivative of the Gaussian kernel. You can read about it here. You know, my lectures I'm stealing from anywhere to save time. Uh, but here you, we define the kernel. We'll look at it later how it looks. And you can probably uh, recognize parts from the normal distribution, if you know that one. Then we can take the derivative, and it looks like this. 
So if you take Gaussian, we say that uh, the variation is uh, 10. That would be plus minus 10 if you look at a normal distribution. Then we define the kernel like uh, the numerical value of this function from minus 10 to 10, so we send it around zero. Then we scale it by dividing with the sum of all these values we have in the kernel. And then we can see it here. So if we place ourselves here, we'll put most weight of the number. If you go out here, uh, 10 numbers, we're really not weighing them a lot. So it's a really nice bell you pass over the data. And, and here I, I had a, f a little fun when I used this uh, kernel thing, uh, list con convol, because this option here, zero, zero, was not defined anywhere. And if you, there's only one and minus one if you look at the documentation. But what, what happens is that it's behaves strangely, especially in the beginning and at the end. So when you use this option zero, zero, that means that you center the kernel. So if I'm standing here, the kernel, this one, will kind of, all the numbers before will be set to zero, and it will weigh this. And now if I'm standing here, it will really weigh this point a lot. And points, if you go to the left, will weigh less and less. And the nice thing, if you look at this one, is that the extrema is not, like compared to the moving arrows, it's not moving to the left or right, so the extrema is where we expect it to be. Uh, so this uh, zero, zero, uh, it's not stated in the documentation, but it, it makes the kernel behave nicely. And here you can see, as well, here's a little option if you want to join, instead of seeing the points, you just say joint, set that to true, and then it'll be connected instead, points. Uh, now, when I want to show it, I want, would like to put uh, legends on, so I need to import a little tool pack, so that's what I do here. I need the plot legends. Packets. So this is just something you do in order to get these options you'll use later. We have to take the derivative, if you recall that one. You, we define the kernel again, but now with the derivative, you see it looks different. So this was where it was on the top. And then it's kind of moving up and down. If we then look at it, uh, the derivative, you can see there is some places here where it's zero, the roots. If you want to find the roots of that, you can use an option. Again, uh, the list convolve, just to return to that, if you, it's exactly the same as uh, with the derivative. Remember, this is a derivative now, as before. <laughs> and if you want the roots here, that's where you have the extrema, either maximum or minimum, then you can kind of using find root, I think, don't think you use that one, uh, where you use the interpolation function, it says x, and you set x to, that's the first guess, uh, you set x to 22 because you can see it's approximately there, it's approximately 50 and then 55 and you get the roots. Or at least a really good guess on it. So now if you want to look at it together, I have scaled the derivative. Uh, so I make a list plot, which you know where I put functions together. I scale the derivative with 50 so it's kind of more clear to see what happens. I define the size of this uh, list plot to uh, 600 uh, pixels. 
And uh, then I set the plot trial. That's the different color is used when it makes the plot. Black, red, green, and blue. I set the legends. I know there's the raw data here. So here, you have the Gaussian kernel here, and then you have 50 times the derivative. So that's the legend which is put here in the figure. So this is a little how to use Mathematica. The legend spacing and all this you have to play a little bit. That's how to put where do you want the legends to be in the plot. And I don't want the, the borders. And now you can see how the derivative behaves. And you can see here where it's zero, that that's also where you have the extrema. So that's a really nice option when you have these noisy data, how to get something you kind of trust in. Believe in. So now uh, assignment 12, you have to do a kind of the same to get acquaintance with Mathematica. Uh, explain it with your own words so you can reflect a little on it and try to filter the data and illustrate it. You don't have to do it exactly like me. The important thing is that we can see that you have been fighting with it, playing with Mathematica. And please remember to play with it. That's the way to learn, learn it. And that's it. So we will meet on Wednesday.